So I have a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Ed Krakes from Iowa, US, yes. and who is a long, a very, um, very knowledgeable and expert in milking uh, and milking quality, and um, all the aspects of basically how to uh, how, how to milk for 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 getting the best or the, mo the, the the greatest quality of milk that we can possibly get. So Ed, all to you. All right, thank you, Yanni. Oh, I have to adjust my voice here a little bit. I'm used to standing behind cows with all kinds of noise, so I tend to talk maybe too loud. Anyway, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, Dr. Edwin Krakus, as Yanni said, from the Central Plains in the United States in the, the state of Iowa. So we're on somewhat of a tight schedule, so I'm, I'll try to hold this mic. I'm sort of the guy that does a lot of hand talking. My wife always said, if you cut your arms off, you wouldn't be able to speak. So I, I'll try to hold it here. I, I've been, I, I work with our church sound system, and it, my frustrating thing is when speakers, I give them a mic, and they, <laughs> so I'll try to just nail this uh, arm down here with the mic. Okay, so we're going to talk today about milk quality. Okay, it's something that's high on everybody's list in the U.S., and I'm sure here in Australia, we're really seeing a lot of that with consumer per perception. So my question would be, oh, the other thing too, this is not a lecture. So I'm, I'm not planning on standing up here just giving a lecture. So I love feedback, questions, comments. Don't be afraid to challenge me. I'll try to challenge you. If nobody, I always say if I speak and nobody gets mad at me, then I probably didn't say enough controversial things. So I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to be tactful, but I also like interaction. So this is my start question. Who needs utter preparation? Which dairies need utter preparation? Every dairy, exactly, every dairy. And so the most of the herds that I work with in the upper Midwest in the USA are freestall parlor dairies. I have worked with some grazing type dairies in the state of Missouri, but even cows that come right off a clean, fresh pasture into the parlor, there still is a huge advantage for having a proper and consistent udder preparation uh, procedure. So why do we do udder preparation? Why do we do that at all? So number one would be we want the highest quality milk that we can get. So if we're in the industry promoting ourselves to consumers and say, we would like your kids to drink this milk. We certainly don't want to be hesitant to say there's nothing better. There's nothing that's a better quality on that. So what does utter preparation do? Okay, so utter prep. So our goal is high quality. Number two would be just plain, <coughs> excuse me, just plain clean. And I've, <clears throat> I've heard this from other grazing producers. They say, well, our cows are clean. They're not in the manure. They're on clean grass, whatever on that. Anybody have that concept? I mean, is there any, is there any thought that if we bring our cows in the parlor, we run them in, we slap the units on, we do all the cups, and we're good to go? Yep. Is that anyone's presentation? Yeah, good to go. Okay. Efficiency, Efficiency exactly. Get them in, get them out. But this is, I'll raise this question. So have you ever had any of your milk equipment people do a milking time evaluation to see once what's happening on your cows? Okay, so this is what I would what I would say you would most likely see. So if this, I'll draw this graph here. So if this is liters of milk, and this is time. What we will see if we do not do at least a minor marginal type of stimulation, it will start out with a flow that looks like this. So you put the cups on, you get immediate milk let down. So you get a flow. But then if you really watch, and especially if you have graphing capability through your equipment people, what will happen is that you'll end up with maybe a three to five second drop 
And if you ever have cows that you say, boy, I put the unit on, and before they get going, they kick it off. Well, they kick it off because it's uncomfortable. So when those teats are not filled with milk, and you get this drop, it takes three to five seconds, and then you do this. Then it takes off, and you milk there on that, and you know, then, you're, then you're down to zero. But this area right here, this beginning of milking area, that's the area that we would like to concentrate on with udder prep. So that does two things. Number one, by not stimulating those teats, giving maybe a 30 to 60 second lag time before the units are put on, the udder is not as responsive to oxytocin. When the cow first comes in and the first, whatever touches her teats first, starts the oxytocin release out of her brain and that hits down to the mammary gland, to the cells that squeeze out the milk. And if that's not immediately high and stays high, so the goal would be on, on herds that have a more consistent udder preparation, you start down here and it just consistently goes like this. Now we're up in this, and so we eliminate this secondary wave. And the biggest thing that I have found for that is that just keeps teats so much healthier. If you ever look at cows that have a condition with rough teat ends, um, just rings around the bottom of the teats, you know, the whole teat skin condition type of thing, this is the biggest problem. People always talk about over milking as at the end of milking. Well, I don't take my units off fast enough, so I get over milking, so that's why I get these uh, sore teats and rough teats and this kind of thing. What my experience has been that most over milking takes place at the beginning of milking. So in the first minute, 30 seconds to a minute, at the beginning of milking, when you don't get immediate milk let down, you have more over milking and there's more stress on the teat ends. Anybody see any questionable teat ends on any of your cows? Everybody has perfect teat ends on cows. No, I, I would be totally surprised if they did. I look at thousands and thousands of teat ends every year, and uh, I see that pretty much everywhere. So the fact that it's a, it's a big dairy, small dairy makes no difference at all. Okay, so, and so then the other thing that we have found with proper teat preparation and good milk let down, we usually get more milk. It's like when the, when the unit gets put on and we get this little depression there on that, it's like it goes, it's a feedback to the cow's brain and it almost says, well, they must not want me to milk any more than this because this is all that my udder is pushing out. And so starting and immediately having milk flow, you tend to get more milk. It's, I have seen already where we've changed milking routine and attachment times and so a liter of milk is not at all impossible to get during a day just because of that. Um, okay, so how do, how do we do it? So the, the typical thing, and do most of you have the swing parlors you know, on that, and that's typical. We have some of those in the U.S. as well. So the first, the first side comes in. Start with the front cow, and, and I'll say this right up front. There's not any perfect procedure that you could do like a cut a bunch of cookies out of a sheet and make it the same for everybody. There's, there's principles that we need to talk about, but everybody's going to be a little bit different depending on what your management is and how your cows flow and all this kind of thing too. But the typical thing that we like to look at would be um, wash, and I'll use that term kind of loosely, okay? Wash, strip, dry, <coughs> attach. And the wash can be anything from um, a pre-dip, uh, it's, it's a chemical type product, and I realize that not all chemical products can be used in all countries around the world, but I know there's some that can be used. So if we use a product like chlorine dioxide, which is for the food grade industry, that's when you, go to the, when you go to the restaurant and they wipe your table off before you sit down, that's the product they use. Kills the bacteria, gets rid of the film, works also very good as a, as a pre-dip. We would call this the pre-dip stage here on that. Pre-dip, 
So something that, a solution that's put on the teats. Can be sprayed on, can be dipped on. I will say right up front that if you're using a sprayer, you will use almost twice as much product as you will if you're using a dipper. But the idea is that when, those, when the cows come in, if they've got mud, manure, grass, whatever, dirt, for sure if it's dry, just take a dry, even take your hand or take a, a towel, paper towel or cloth towel and just wipe the udder just to get the loose dirt off. Dip all four teats and do that with a series of, depending on the size of your parlor, four, eight, up. I never like to do more than 10 cows if you would have a, like a 20 cow parlor or something. But uh, it works really well. And then at the, at the same time, then you go back to the first cow and do the strip, a couple strips out of each teat. Number one, it starts the milk flow. Number two, it makes sure that the teat is open. And number three, it gets rid of the first, the first couple squirts of milk have the highest bacteria and the highest cell count in. Plus that gets that oxytocin release much faster from the cow's brain down to her udder. Dry the teat with a towel, attach the unit. You should see immediate full milk flow on that. And you say, well, that's going to take maybe a minute. So can I, so if I'm milking 300 cows, can I take another 300 minutes twice a day to do this? And the answer to that is if you, if you start this and consistently do it, it takes a while to get where you want to be. But if you start this and consistently do it, you will find that your cows will milk out faster. And typically I see no longer milking time and sometimes even less. That's hard to believe until you've really, really concentrated on it and worked at trying to make it happen. Because the fact that those cows have a full force pushing, it's like they're pushing milk out of their udder, you know, on that. So you think about how a milking machine works. A milking machine doesn't squeeze like we do if we're milking by hand. It just opens up and the vacuum pulls the milk. And so if the cow's oxytocin release is pushing the udder to push the milk out, she'll milk out clean and fast, and your total milking time will actually be less. Everybody believe me on that? <laughs> it, it is true. The first, when someone brings this up, you think, yeah, right, this, this guy from the US is gonna come and tell us that's something we've done for 35 years and uh, we, we've gotta make some changes. I just, I bring it up more as good food for thought. Okay, milking time is typically reduced with good udder prep. Yes, go ahead. What would be your typical training or transition time before you'd expect a herd to realize mm -hmm. that increase in milking time? I would say typically if, if you can get a consistent prep going, so you do the you know, wash, strip, dry, attach prep, seven to 10 days, that's about all that it really takes for cows to learn the, the the new procedure, so to speak. And, and a lot of times, I've seen it be much shorter than that, but I certainly wouldn't give up um, until I'm at least 10 days down the road. And then, so then, the, the other thing that I think is really, really important to pay attention to is make sure that your milking system is able to handle you know, this improved milk flow. So if you have bad pulsators, how many routinely get their pulsators tested by equipment people? Yeah. So some do, some don't. I do a fair amount of pulsator testing back in the US and it's amazing how often I find one pulsator. So if I've got 10 units, this is my, this is my math that I work with people. I've got 10 milking units, I'm milking 300 cows. So each unit is milking 30 cows a milking so 60 cows a day if you're milking twice. So if one unit is bad and it's not consistently like all the other nine, we've got 60 cows a day that are at risk for mastitis, incomplete milk out, more teat damage, more injury, more edema when you pull the teats off. So pulsator testing to me is one of the cheap, easy, you, you just can't get along without it. Large parlors where they're milking, you know, a few thousand cows, they basically do, a lot of them do pulsator testing at weekly or every fortnight. Um, smaller units, smaller farms that I work with that are under 200 cows, 
We try to at least test pulsators every other month, every third month at the very latest. Pulsators get dirty, the rubber cracks, you know, those things too. So I would really encourage to work with your dealers and have your pulsators tested on a regular basis. Oh, I'll make sure I'm not running on time, running over on time. <clears throat> so to say, okay, what's, what then is my ideal utter prep? And the ideal is whatever you can make work with your system as long as you're accomplishing what you need to do. So we need to stimulate the udder, and that's usually done by the first touch of the teat is the beginning of stimulation. We want to make sure that they're clean. This is, I, I work with a lot of Hispanic milkers in the U.S., Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, South America, all the South American countries, that, that type of thing. So, and I speak a little bit of Spanish, but I've learned, this is my little phrase that I've learned. So when, when you're ready to put that cup on, if you're, if this is, I'm not trying to be too graphic, but if you're not willing to drink right out of that teat, just like a, a calf, it's not clean enough. Because the milk that comes out of that teat, what's the best procedure you can do to clean a dirty teat? <laughs> you put a milking cup on because they're bathed in milk and they're massaged and every bit of that mud, manure, gravel, whatever, uh, goes right down into the milk. You say, well, I've got a filter sock. The filter sock will take care of it. The filter, the, what you see on the filter sock is only the stuff that's big enough to see. The stuff that's not big enough to see, bacteria, viruses, you know, just grime uh, will go right through. So I, I so my thing is, is when I go to many parlors, I'll, my first thing is what, if I would drink the milk right out of the tank on this parlor, I'm pretty happy with it. If I tell the owner, you know what, I wouldn't drink this milk if I knew where it was coming from. That's not a good thing. So that the whole idea of clean teat is the biggest thing that we need to think about. So, so then the idea is that if Probably about half the herds that I work with do strip a couple strips out, you know, right at the time of pre-dip. And the idea behind that is, number one, it's an easy way to detect mastitis. If we see the typical clots, flakes, chunks, watery milk, whatever, if we don't do a strip, you know, then go back and look at your filter sock again. And if you have a lot of, a lot of flakes and clots and gargot, if that's the, the right term, on your filter sock, then your people are missing mastitis cows. And a mastitis cow that is missed lends itself to constantly creeping up somatic cell count. So you get a lot of that kind of thing going on then too. So the, the goal for time would be, okay, so we say, what's, what's the best time? So if this is the first time I touch the teats, by the time I go through and, and okay, so if I've got a parlor and I'm doing five cows at a time, okay, so I, I do this dip or wash or whatever you want to call it, you know, on number one, two, three, four, five, I go back to number one, I wipe it off with a paper or a cloth towel, if you could do a washing machine and cloth towel, I wipe her off and I attach this unit. We want to be looking at about 60 seconds, it takes 60 to 90 seconds for a good milk letdown so that those teats are filled with milk, you put the unit on, you have immediate milk flow, you don't get this biphasic flow like this. The milk starts and it goes like this and you get your whole milking system done. And that takes a stopwatch. What I've had already to try and, and help people understand that is they say, well, we, it, it's long enough, you know, we're about that much. So when I get in there with my phone and I put my stopwatch on it, it's much easier to be too short than to be too long. So, so the, way to, the way to resolve that is, if you're doing five cows and you're fine that you're consistently putting your, your uh, cups on from 40 to 45 seconds, add a couple more cows. So that's the biggest way that I have been able to help people understand that timing thing. So you add a couple more cows, you go back, you dry, you attach, the milking completes itself, it comes off, and you're good to go. Yes? Ed, just a quick question on the stripping component of that. So for, for the average herd in New South Wales, a couple hundred cows, what, what's the value to those herds, um, and, and what would you recommend? How often are that, could they be stripped? 
tripping with a one milk in your day? Is it, and what benefits can they expect to see by doing that? Okay, good, good question, Andrew. So what I see on even my smaller herds, I have a couple herds that are less than 50 cows. And they've got to the point where they strip every cow, every, every milking. Just the idea that when you're, when you're putting on your pre-dip and as you're wiping with your towel or before you wipe with your towel, just a couple squirts out of each teat. It doesn't take a lot. Um, you can look at what the milk's doing. That's an extra little boost to oxytocin release for, uh, for the cow to get good milk let down. And uh, it, it makes sure that the teats are open. And again, as I said before, the, the milk that's in the teat cistern has the highest somatic cell count and the highest level of bacteria. So you get rid of that, you just have cleaner milk all the way around. If you say, you know what, I don't know that I'm convinced that there's enough to do that, okay, try it, one milking a day. And I, I've even been in large parlors where they'll, where they'll have somebody stripping maybe once a week. Just an idea to help understand what's going on in the other. Yep, question. Do you provide a hockey helmet when you're doing the stripping? No. <laughs> well, that's funny. That's, uh, I've, I've got a friend that milks in Kansas, and he actually does have his milkers wear hockey helmets. <laughs> They're jerseys. Maybe that's a little more on that. You know what I, what I find? Okay. You know what I find is that, is that if, if we do that, that dip, that pre-dip on there, and so we're not trying to strip dry teats, they tend to not be as nearly as irritating as trying to strip a dry teat. And I understand, you know, and I understand. So I guess my biggest thing is, Yanni tells me we have five minutes. <laughs> Uh, my biggest thing is just to, oh, 10 minutes, okay. Well, I want to make sure we get the questions in, is I want to I sort of challenge you. You know, if, if we're in the world market and we're using the perception that consumers have of the milk that's coming out of Australia, the United States, uh, EU, wherever it is, if, we, if there's ever, the, the thing that I worry about the most with my clients, if they have an undercover video coming on their farm I usually don't worry about the, the occasional calf that might get mistreated. It's not good, I, I totally on that. But if I would have, if, if I was an undercover uh, video person, I would go and watch the parlor and see how clean those cows are. And most of the time you could make a really big point of, this milk is dirty. Why would anybody want to drink milk that they don't even take the time to clean the teats and put the units on? That milk goes right into the tank Certainly, it gets pasteurized, but that doesn't kill all the bacteria. The best udder prep in the world will only reduce your bacteria load about 85%. Okay. What's the average cell count of herds in the U.S.? Uh, it's coming down. You know, the goal is to be under, definitely the goal to be under 200,000. So I don't do any of that. I sit about 135. Well, and I was just going to say, I think the, uh, the other thing that I've seen is sometimes I've seen a herd where they do everything, what I would say is, not up to where they should be, and they have very little clinical mastitis and very low cell count. So a lot of that would be what, you know, look at your filter sock. If your filter sock is dirtier than what you would like to chew on, then I would try to look at some improvement in udder prep. Okay, and then look at teat ends. The other thing that always gives me a good idea is that if, the, if there's a lot of teat ends that are rough, have the, the, the callus circular ring on, there's probably some over-milking take place, usually at the beginning of milking. I think cell count and clinical mastitis is a really good uh, bookmark or a report card, I would say, but it's not the whole answer. Because the, and so the other thing, does it, do they ever do milk cultures, bulk tank cultures? Does your milk plant do bulk tank cultures uh, in Australia routinely or occasionally? Yeah, so that's the other thing that I do a lot of, I, I work with, milk plants and we do, we culture the bulk tank just to see once, and it'll never, it's never sterile, milk is never sterile. But if you have a lot of environmental streps or in the, in your rainy season, if you get a lot of the coliform type mastitis, your udder prep will help a lot to prevent those as well. Pre, post dip, is everybody routinely dipping before they go out? Some, some do, some don't. 
Yeah. You know, there again, I'll just make a quick thing on post dipping. <clears throat> There's three reasons why we post dip, and I'm not fussy what product gets used. Number one is to remove the milk film. When you take that unit off, there's milk film on that teat, and so bacteria love milk, and they love liquid, so they grow like crazy. Number two is the skin conditioning agent that's in the post dip really keeps your teats soft, healthy. The first barrier to anything is the skin, and so if we have chapped teats, cracked teats, whatever, have a lot more likely to, ha <coughs> to have utter, utter health problems and uh, then the third is that leaves that protective film so that when they go out, they're protected until the next milking. Would a um, teat scrubber do something similar to all that? Yep, teat scrubbers work good. There are, there are good teat scrubbers and there are terrible teat scrubbers. Um, be careful that which one you get to make sure that you do some research and talk to people that have used them and what kind of results you get with it on that. But teat scrubbers are great. That sort of takes care of, it doesn't strip, but it does a lot of good stimulation. So in, in larger parlors, a teat scrubber put on, what I like about teat scrubbers, um, for sure if you have a herd that you have employees milking, it's much easier for an employee to learn to use a teat scrubber properly. And every shift will do it the same because there's really only one way to do it. Employees that are trained to do it by hand, <clears throat> excuse me, they can be good at it, but it's a lot less likely to be consistent than with the teat scrubber. So I like those a lot. Questions, comments? Anything I missed? Um, if people have got automatic takeoffs, Ed, and they're doing this program, what, what sort of changes do you think they can make to their takeoffs? Yes. <clears throat> yep, no, another good question. So. We talk about some over milking at the beginning of milking, but at the end of milking, we can always we can often see that too. Okay, so I'll talk I'll talk really fast. So work work with your dealer to check your end of milking flow rate. What I do is one of the ways to do that is when the unit comes off, strip out just with a cup, strip out what's left in those teats, and if there's not at least 50 mil and even up to 125 left in the udder when the unit comes off, it's probably milking too dry. Work with your dealer, they can, they can change the settings on the end of your milking takeoffs, both in terms of flow rate and in the amount of time that it's in low flow. And uh, it helps a lot for preventing over milking and also speeds up your parlor. We're probably done. Okay. Any other questions or comments? So I say, I hope I stimulated some thinking, you know, or you go back home and talk among yourself, say, how can, how can we do this? There's, there's a lot of good information online um, of, of various things. I've looked at some of the Dairy Australia videos and stuff. They're really good. I'm, I'm very, I've actually used them on a couple of my herds in the US because I think they did a better job um, for that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I guess if I was if I was convinced that the the herd could not implement a good startup procedure with a pre dip or something like that, I would not strip. Just for that reason. On that. If if you if you've been convinced that the putting the units on dry teats and the teats are clean, I, I would argue that they're probably not. They might look clean, but they're really not. But anyway, if they are I would not strip because I think that would lend itself more to that potential. Yeah. But again, I would, I would never recommend putting units on uncleaned teats. Other questions, comments? Do I what? I, I have not. You think they would throw tomatoes at me or something? <laughs> Yeah, I, I keep watching. I don't see anybody with any missiles that are they're going to launch in my direction. But uh, 
I understand, and I understand that in a, in a grazing situation, there is some historical things that have taken place that would lend itself to be reluctant to try this. But I would also say that I have been involved in grazing herds in Missouri. I've got a good friend in the University of Missouri that has worked, you know, I've worked with him. And once you get it figured out, none of them are willing to go back to just slap it on the units because you do get a lot better milk down overall. Milk quality goes up and, uh, and cow health in, improves as well. Okay? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am MD Ashrafulistam from the Dairy Science Group of University of Sydney. And uh, I am presenting a part of my research on feedlot cattle, uh, on their timing of feedback actions, and their performance and behavioral pattern. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Um, my research topic is about timing of feedback access and the growth of feedlot cattle. And uh, in the brochure, maybe you found that feedlot cattle, fast at feed, fast in gain. That was the business title. Uh, the background of my research is that um, especially under group fed condition, um, where there is limited bunk space allowance, cattle that are dominant get preference to the feed when fresh feed is delivered, and uh, less dominant cattle get, get a delayed access. And uh, uh, from the technical point of view, as it is very difficult to find out when a cattle is coming to the feed visually, it was not previously done very much. So it's really important to find out what happens across 24 hours uh, according to the timing of feedback access and how their behavior and performance is affected. So our objective was to determine the impact of feedback access timing relative to the timing that feed was offered on the feeding behavior and average daily gain of cattle. We did it on a feedlot with beef cattle, but uh, uh, we can say that uh, uh, regarding the um, free stall dairies and uh, also for group fed cattle where feed bank space is uh, limited, uh, our results is equally um, equivalent and equally applicable. So we used 100 pan of feed load cattle and these cattle were inducted with all flex ear tech sensors, you can see here. These are three-dimensional accelerometers based sensors, uh, monitors the cow behavior uh, based on their ear movements, and the manufacturer has their proprietary algorithm to trace out every behavior. And uh, especially, we have not uh, considered for this all the behaviors. They count almost nine behavior states. We consider only their eating time and duration of eating, rumination time and duration of rumination. And uh, also, we followed their live weight gain to calculate the average daily gain on day 39 and day 75. That was the whole uh, feeding period. And uh, these animals were offered with a TMR, a high green TMR, you can see here. And uh, only in the morning, around 10 a.m., they were offered. And we monitored uh, for four days, though we, for the analysis, we eliminated the first three days as their adjustment. That was uh, totally from induction to day six, our observation, but we only considered the last four days for our analysis. And uh, we grouped these animals according to their timing to feed bunk within one hour of feed offer. Those animals who did not get access to feed bank within all those four days, within one hour of feed offer, we grouped them zero. They were absent for feeding. Uh, 
you can see the black line. Uh, Maybe difficult for the <laughs> backside. Um, so these animals did not have any access to feed bunk when feed was offered for all our observation days. They were absent up to one hour. And uh, their presence was remarkably high after four hours. Uh, but for other groups, like uh, those who are present for only one day within one hour feed offer, we grouped them as group one. Uh, for two days, for group two, three days, group three. And uh, those cattle who were present all four days, uh, maybe the most dominant, uh, they are feeding pattern. But if you consider with group zero, the black line, the all other groups had almost a consistent eating time. Here we represent the percentage of their eating time across 24 hours they allotted uh, for their feeding behavior. Uh, so you can see all these groups are almost consistent throughout their feed, feeding time budget. But this one showing distinctly different pattern showing that they have adjusted a time when other groups are uh, eating less, uh, showing they might have their subordinate nature. They are not getting enough access to the feed. And uh, what we found that uh, the, the group zero eating time, rumination time was significantly uh, lower compared to other groups. And uh, we also compared the average daily gain for the mid-feed period and also end of feed period. You can find that uh, the mid-feed period average daily gain for group zero was only... The time is up already. <laughs> uh, so, okay. Uh, so the average daily gain was, uh, for the group four, almost 150% uh, time higher. And uh, final average daily gain was also 30% higher for group one to four as a uh, combined group. And in conclusion, that uh, we need to be careful about those cattle who are really late at feed. It's okay. Uh, yeah, the, they are late at work. I don't. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, those cattle who are really late at feed, uh, and uh, our proposal is that we need to find out them from the tag data, and we need to segregate, and we need to consider a definite uh, feeding schedule for them. Uh, segregating them and feeding them separately may allow them to have their welfare well, their performance well, and uh, that will benefit uh, cattle in feedlot and also for the cattle in uh, freestall dairies and also for uh, rearing of uh, bull cows in feedlots and also the uh, replacement heifers. Thank you. spoke about the timing for, of access, or perhaps the first access of the cattle to the yeah. feed, but another way of looking at it might be the pattern of feed, feeding. So, I mean, one cow might have a certain pattern, another cow might have almost the same pattern, but shifted in time. So it might not be the timing of, of access, it might be the pattern of feed. So have you considered segregating the, the, cat, the cows, or the cattle data into ones that have di different patterns of feed, whether they have one big meal a day, or two big meals a day, or three or four, or whether they eat constantly throughout the day, so that there could be differences in, in the pattern of feeding as distinct from the first timing of access to the uh, feed. Yeah, we have not tested it, but uh, it, uh, from our uh, primary objective, we wanted to know what happens though for those cattle who are really late at feed, uh, considering that they may might be subordinate and they are not getting access when they want. Is there a Thank question? I've got a couple of quick, because my guy. Yep. I've got a couple of quick ones. Um, was feed space limiting, where all animals are able to get to the bunk at one point in time? 
Was there so enough space across the bunk for all animals to access it? Uh, in our experiment? Yeah. No, only 30% of the cattle had the access to simultaneously feed. Okay. So, um, how much, how much refusal percentage were you targeting at the end of 24 hours? Was there any feed left on the bunk? Um, typically, they were fed only once at that time, but we have not considered the leftover things. Uh, my third, sorry, question is, of, of the animals in group zero, how many, do, do we know how many were in that group and how many went on to be treated for illness? Uh, how, how many? many? How many animals ended up in group zero? Oh, yeah, it was 25% uh, of the okay. animals. Uh, and did, do we know what percentage of those animals went on to get treated for illness or, or disease? Um, no, not no. known. Okay, no problem. One more question? Yeah. Um, could you speculate on the differences in dry matter intake of the different groups? Um, it looks like G1 there is uh, <coughs> spend a lot of time eating but it grows really, really quickly. Uh, group 1? Well, G1, for example, uh, it has a, quite a short eating time. Yeah. But um, it still grows well. So is it eating faster or...? Yeah, it could... It, yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, it could have happened that uh, there have the differences in their diameter intake, but uh, we have not traced it out. We'll bring on our next speaker, Elaine. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Yi Jing from University of Melbourne. Sorry for the small poster. <laughs> I hope everyone can have a look. Um, yeah. So let's start. My topic for the presentation and also for my research is the effect of heat stress on dairy cows in different stages of lactation. So before let's uh, get some, before let's go in track, let me get some um, background information so we can better understand the uh, experiments. Uh, so um, first of all, the, we talked much about automatic milking system yesterday, and it's also the data from uh, were collected in a farm um, with voluntary cow movement in Duki in Victoria, uh, which uses three lally uh, robotic milking machines, which is just for information, uh, and. Um, uh, the, every day the machine collects, uh, records the milk production, uh, milk protein, milk fats ev uh, for each cow. And then uh, also um, as well other factors related to milk uh, or milking behavior like the frequency. Uh, here I want to ask some questions. How well do you know about heat stress? Uh, do you worry about heat stress on farms? Uh, so, what kind of measurements you use to like detect heat stress? Okay, uh, I talked with uh, several people yesterday, and they gave me the answer like when the temperature uh, increases, the cow suffer from heat stress, and that's the easy way. Uh, but I want to say here is that humidity also humidity also plays an important role, and there is a more scientific way we use to measure heat stress uh, is temperature humidity index. It's an equation combining the uh, temperature and the humidity. Uh, and to predict the heat stress, uh, we can see here uh, between 68 to 72, um, the daily average um, THI. Uh, in this range, we call low heat stress, which means it's okay for cows to handle. And uh, from 72 to 78 is moderate heat stress. Uh, when it's up to 78, um, we must be very cautious about the cows because we don't want to lose them. Um, previous work presents that uh, when the uh, THI arrives at 72, um, the milk production decreases significantly. Um, and also you may observe that. And 
luckily we had um, had uh, a whole month with a single heat wave here. And it's February with four continuous day. The average THI of um, of which um, is upper was upper than 72. And seven days before here and uh, 14 days after this, um, those days the average THI were lower than 72. So we can. Uh, have a measurement, uh, and these are the numbers in different uh, carving groups. Uh, because of we use AMS, so um, is uh, we need to use split carving instead of seasonal carving, uh, because even one month stop of uh, using the machine uh, means uh, the loss of money. Uh, so we have spring carving, um, the summer carving, and the autumn carving. Uh, here are the. Results. Thank you. <laughs> it's fine. Um, we can see the green line and yellow line uh, is spring carving group and the autumn carving group. They have very similar trend. During the HGS, this area, the uh, milk production, uh, the milk solids decreases, but it would recover uh, four or five days after the HGS event. But we want to focus on is the summer group, uh, summer coming group here. Uh, before the HGS event, the increasing rate was 0 0.09. 0 0.9 uh, kilograms per day. But after the history, it became to 0 0.03 kilograms per day. And it didn't show any recovery thing, which means the, we lost a lot of milk. So in conclusion, um, summer calving is not suggested. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Uh, I'm not that. Yeah, because it's pasture based, we do measure the concentrate every day, like the concentrate intake and the concentrate uh, remain. But uh, I, I did some analysis, but it's not that accurate and not that significant in this occasion. Yeah. Uh, in yeah, in my experiments, usually usually HGS can be diagnosed as many uh, like um, psychological indicators, and uh, in my experiment, I just want to directly link the uh, um, the HGS, the THI, with the milk production. So it can directly shows that how how much we lose. Uh, so. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, so I just want to like fit. How did I measure? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll even jump in there. So the question was, how how did you measure heat yeah. stress? So I'll even add to that. Did you do body temperature, respiration rate? Uh, you know, were you having any cow side parameters that you measured? Uh. In my experiment, because it's big data analyzing, so we just use THI, temperature humidity index, with the um, most important, the, the milk production. And we also link this to some uh, weight loose. And um, yeah, they also give us the, uh, not that important, uh, somatic cell counts. And also the THI value here is quite competitive, like, uh, like uh, sorry. Uh, 68 and 72, we want to uh, see which is also be better to measure the milk production during the HGS. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so all right, you can hear me. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, personally, I'm also doing my PhD on heat stress, monitoring mm -hmm. and mitigation, sensor based. So, not sensor based for my part. Mm -hmm. uh, you said only temperature, humidity, you consider it. What mm -hmm. was the threshold for you? You consider it. This threshold. Like we have to 
Oh, sorry. Uh, what was your temperature humidity threshold to consider that uh, those animals were heat stress? And did you consider any physiological things except the production? Uh, yeah, they used to use panting score and other measurements, but in my uh, experiments, I didn't stay there on the farms all the day. So we just have, uh, we just want to show something very realistic and very directly to show the, <laughs> yeah. So we just use uh, THI, use the line of the milk production to do the analysis. I have one more quick question. Did you compare any breeds? Were these all the same breed of cows? Are they Holstein, Jerseys, crossbreds, what? Uh, it's, it's Holstein, no Jersey. Uh, uh, it's just one single wave, and we are still struggling to do uh, because sometimes it's continuous waves. And also, uh, first, uh, my first objective is to compare, um, <coughs> sorry, 68 and uh, 72 because now there's some uh, research shows that because the high production cows now, so they are uh, the heat tolerance decreases among cows. So. Yeah, and I, we also have many other figures. We try to like um, get them in the somatic cell counts to see whether it will affect by heat stress and live weights and other figures. Concentrates take in maybe yeah. Okay, I think our time is up. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mardati. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Sydney, Australia with uh, Dairy Science Group. And as I mentioned yesterday, today I would like to talk about the association between body weight change with feet and water intake as well as urination and defecation of dairy cows. So as we all know here, uh, grazing system is the largest uh, dairy system in Australia. So, but the limitation with this uh, system is that we don't really know how much the cows eat, which is still a million dollar question for us. And there are so many techniques, methods have been developed to estimate and predict the intakes, including a mathematical model. But uh, the accuracy of the model is still a challenge for us. And from our previous data, we believe that uh, the problem sits in the substantial amount of noise created by uh, daily life weight. As we can see here in the graph, the body fat rate uh, every day, not yet only every day, but even hourly due to the gut feel, uh, rumor feel, everything. So the overall aim of my project is if we can uh, improve the uh, measurement of the weight by correcting uh, daily life weight by the known factors that can contribute to the uh, gut feel. So ultimately, we can improve the prediction or the estimation of the intake, including like uh, water intake, uh, urination, also defecation. So, but today I'll just, uh, before we can correct the body weight, we need to investigate to determine how significant those uh, factors will affect uh, the daily life weight. So, uh, in this experiment, we're trying to quantify the changes in animal life weight to the intake and uh, also the output, like urination and defecation that contribute to the daily life weight fluctuations. So, what we did was we have 10 cows and we fed with four kilograms of lucent cube morning and afternoon in a scale box like this. So um, we give we also give them uh, ten kilograms of water, and we collect urine and feces manually using a bucket, and we weigh the manual and uh, the urine and the feces. And we went, we were not using the weight. Uh, displayed by the reader, but we use the continuous continuous weight directly from the load bar, and we determine the live weight change by substrate 
think the live weight before eating, the average of uh, one minute weight from the live weight after eating. And we developed the model using uh, a linear mixed model in R. So, um, as the result here, the fitted model, as we can see here, if the cows eat one kilogram of cube, they gain one kilogram. So if they uh, defecate one kilogram, so they will lose one kilogram of uh, body weight. So therefore, uh, we believe that um, this factor has the potential to improve the estimation of the, the uh, life and ultimately we can improve the estimation of the intake. Thank you. We just uh, using the bucket. We, we, once we saw the tail, so we just ready with the bucket. <laughs> because because the cow is is in the uh, weighing box, so it's easy for us. Yes, we just. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we actually we just finished with uh, another trial with the longer period. So we borrow harness and the urine tube from Alim Bank to collect the urine and the feces. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, so now the time comes. You all have a scorecard.